Well, good morning. Um, <clears throat> this morning, as I was, uh, well, <laughs> I wasn't preparing for the message this morning, don't worry. But when I was preparing for the message this morning, I was thinking back to my own uh, Christmas past. And so for some of you, uh, you know that I grew up as a pastor's kid uh, in a small little church with about 70 people. And every year we had a children's concert. And so with that, basically every year we had uh, a play that we were a part of. Now, I was one of the two token males. And so with that, I often uh, played Joseph in the play. And then they would pick one of the girls, I guess probably the luckiest, to be Mary. Um, and then uh, we would have uh, this uh, play. And then my friend, the other boy, who showed up only about once a month, they gave him one of the sheep because there wasn't any speaking roles. So uh, this was one of my memories that I had. And then the other memory I had, uh, this one year, one of the girls uh, in the children's um, ministry memorized the entire Christmas story. And she dressed up as an angel, and here we are halfway through the night, and the lights dim down, and she stands up on this platform, then the light shines on her, and she rehearses the whole story without any notes. And at the time, I was amazed, and I'm still pretty amazed by that. And so when I was thinking back on these experiences that I had as a kid, I've realized that I've heard the Christmas story many, many, many times. I'm only 24, so some of you have heard it far more times than I have. And sometimes when we hear a story so many times, we get kind of numb towards it, as though we've already heard everything there is to hear. There's nothing really new for us to get from that. And so this morning, we're looking at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. And in this Christmas story, you're, you're going to have heard it many times, but I want us to come at it with a fresh set of eyes. I want us to come at it, looking at it to say, what does this text have to say about God, and what does it have to say to us today specifically? And so in preparation for the sermon, I actually, uh, we read through this passage at youth, and I asked them what their thoughts on the passage were and some of the questions they had. Uh, we talked about it as a staff, and then also in my own personal observations and questions and then reading on the passage. So today, we're going to look at this passage in three different sections, looking at three different main things. So the first thing we'll look at is why the census? Right? We always talk about the census, but why in the world did Luke think it was important, and why did he put it in here? The second question is we're going to look at, uh, at verse 14. It's very famous. You'll note it when we'll come to it. But how is it actually really supposed to be translated? And then we're also going to look at the shepherds and ask why in the world are shepherds the ones that the angels appear to? And then finally, in the third section, we're going to look at the different responses that there were towards Christ's birth and why those responses happened and then what we can learn from those responses. So with these questions in mind, we're going to start Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available to them. All right, so the very first three verses uh, that are described here detail the census. One, it was decreed by Caesar Augustus while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town. And believe it or not, these three opening verses have caused scholars great pains in trying to understand this. So, you might ask why, and there's quite a few different reasons, but we're going to look at two of them. But before we do that, um, I want to just make it clear why we address issues like this in the Bible. At first glance, we may come to issues like this and say, well, it doesn't really matter for anything for me today. And if a person were to say that, I would disagree with them. A major stumbling block that many people have for Christianity is that they say that the Bible has contradictions in it. And especially when you look at the Gospels, one Gospel may look as though it is contradicting another. And so if there's contradictions, then how can we trust the Bible? We have to just throw it out entirely. And so 
disagreeing with that, we need to, instead of throwing out the Bible when we see contradictions or what seem like contradictions, we instead need to see how the two texts can actually be complementary. So this is a, an issue for us as, as Christians, but also as we talk to other people as they have questions about the Bible. So the Bible is authoritative, we can trust it, but sometimes we have to work hard to see what it is saying. So, with that, we're going to look at the first problem. So, according to Matthew, Jesus was born during the reign of who? Herod. In Matthew, Jesus is born during the reign of Herod, which would have put his birth at around 4 BC. Now, that's really confusing, because BC actually means before Christ. And so, if Jesus was born at 4 BC, that means he was born four years before Christ. So, how did that happen? Well, there was a later dating error where uh, the person thought that Jesus was born at zero, but now scholars actually see, no, he was born at 4 BC. So that's confusing, but it's what it is. So Jesus was born at 4 BC during the reign of Herod, and that's what Matthew tells us. But here in Luke 2, it says that Quirinius is the governor. So according to historical records, Quirinius did not rule until 6 to 9 AD. So in Matthew, Jesus is born 4 BC during the time of Herod, but then in Luke's account, it says that he's born during the time of Quirinius, and according to historic records, Quirinius is until 6 to 9 AD. So what do we do with that? Second problem concerns verse 4, which says that Joseph went up to the town of Naz- or from Nazareth to go to ba- Bethlehem for the census. But the question is, why did Joseph have to go to Bethlehem if he was living in Nazareth? Could you imagine how impractical of a census that would be? Um, How many of you live in the place that you were born? A few. Everyone else is going back to the place that they were born. Could you imagine how impractical that would be? I would be going back to Lissville, Ontario. My wife would be going back to Merritt, BC for the census. And then we get back there for the census. And who even cares who was born there? So here's the question. Why did Joseph go to Bethlehem if he was living in Nazareth, and why does it matter? So, what are the solutions to this? The first solution to the first problem concerning Quirinius, there's been two main ideas that have been presented. Um, First, it is possible that Quirinius had authority in the east while Herod was governor, And so that even though Herod was the governor at the time, the census could be attributed to Quirinius. And so they said Quirinius was the one in charge of the census. The other option, though, is that verse 2 should be translated, this was the first registration before Quirinius was governor of Syria. And in your Bibles, some of you will have that footnoted, that instead of while, it could actually mean before. The difficulty with verse 2 is that it doesn't actually have any word to be translated meaning before or to mean while. It doesn't, or even after for that matter of fact. Um, So quite woodenly, one could translate it, the census first Quirinius governor of Syria. So, was it the first census while Quirinius was governor, or was it the first census before Quirinius was governor? Either translation is possible. And so while it may seem at first sight that Matthew and Luke have to be contradicting each other, when we look at it more closely, we can see that they actually can complement each other. The solution to the second problem of why Joseph went to Bethlehem concerns everyone's favorite, taxes. As mentioned earlier, it does not make sense for a person to have had to go to their hometown for a census. Um, Rather, a census took place so that they could know who should pay taxes on certain properties. And so each person who owned property in a certain place had to go to that place for the census so that the state could know who to tax. So scholars believe that it is likely that Joseph owned property in Bethlehem, and for that reason, he had to go to Bethlehem for the census so they could know to tax him. However, he did not have a house because they had nowhere to stay. (laughs) So here we are. Mary and Joseph leave Nazareth, and they go to Bethlehem for a census. And verse 6 and 7 say Mary was pregnant, and while they were in Bethlehem, she gave birth to the firstborn son. And remember from Pastor Richard's sermon last year, verse 7 is not talking about them finding no room in an inn, but in a house. 
And the story says nothing about an inn or an innkeeper. That has come about through tradition. It's not actually in the Bible. So here's Mary and Joseph. They come. They have no place to stay in any house. So Mary gives birth to Jesus, wraps him in cloth, and places him in a manger. And notice what else the story says nothing about. Animals. We don't actually know if there's animals at the manger or not. So sorry to my friend at Glen Elk, but he was probably not in the Bible. Nevertheless, though, uh, we're back at the beginning. Why the census? Why did Luke feel the need to record this census, and why in Bethlehem? Well, notice in verse, set, verse 4, it says that he went back to Bethlehem because he belonged to the house and line of David. See, to Luke, it doesn't actually matter if Joseph went to Bethlehem because of tax purposes or not. What mattered to Luke is that he went to Bethlehem because he was in the line of David. If we go to Micah 5.2, we have a big pointer as to why they had to go to Bethlehem. It says... But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be a ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Out of Bethlehem, through the clan of Judah, will come one who will be the ruler over Israel. And then, if we turn to everyone's favorite, the gene genealogy in Matthew 1, Remember, this is the very first passage in the New Testament. We see the name of Judah in verse 3, who then later on down the line, there is David in verse 6. And then finally in verse 16, we have Jacob, the father of Joseph, and Joseph, the father of Jesus. And so here we are in Luke 2. Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of David, returning to Bethlehem for the birth of his son, who is the everlasting king, the long-awaited Messiah, and the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. The census was actually used by God to bring Joseph to Bethlehem, where Jesus would be born, in order that his birth would happen in accordance to the Old Testament scriptures. That's where I thought. Cool. Well, I'm glad. I'm really glad you thought that. But where is Jesus born? Not in a palace amongst royalty, but in a stable where animals belong. Here is the long-awaited king and Messiah, the Son and God, excluded from human society. But at the same time, there is peace in all of this. Not because Jesus would grow up to set people free from political oppression, but because he would grow up to set people free from their sins. There's a peace that we have looking back, knowing that the Messiah has actually come. The prophecies have been fulfilled. Jesus really is who the Old Testament said he would be, and he really did die so that people can be forgiven of their sins. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, I was talking to someone, and, and him and I were having small talk, and I asked him how he was doing, and he mentioned that for the most part he's doing well, but recently he felt uh, very convicted of the sin in his own life. He mentioned that he tries really hard to retain from sinning. He tries really hard to pursue in his relationship with God. He says that he really aims to kill areas of sin in his life. And he said every time that he does that, he just realizes that there's another area of sin in his life. And he said that although he feels like there is progress, he feels discouraged because of the amount of sin. And I resonate with him. I feel this way sometimes too, and I'm sure many of you do as well. But for all of us, we can have peace. We have peace knowing that although we are sinful people, we can go to Jesus and we, be, we can be forgiven of that sin. We have peace knowing that Jesus was born as an excluded baby, that he did grow up, and that he has set us free. We are saved not actually by how hard we try or by what we do, but we are saved purely by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. And this is the peace that we have as we rest in Jesus Christ. So why the census? It was so that Joseph and Mary could go to Bethlehem, so that Jesus, the Messiah King, would be born according to what the scriptures prophesied. He was born here that he would grow up to die for us, 
giving us peace, knowing that if we put our trust in him and follow him, we will be forgiven. Now, on to the second part, where we'll look at uh, the notorious verse 14. So in order to do this, we're going to read the full context. So open back up to your Bibles, uh, Luke 2, verses 8 to 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Okay, so here we are. Jesus has been born, and he's in a manger wrapped in cloth, and outside there are shepherds watching their flock when, bam, an angel appears. And naturally, these dudes are terrified, right? You're just outside when an angel appears to you. That's a scary scene. Um, But the angel tells them not to be afraid, but he brings them good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Verse 11 tells them that Jesus is the Messiah, born born according to the prophecies that we just talked about. And then in verse 12, the angel gives them the sign to look for, that Jesus is wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger, just as it says in verse 7. Then, verse 13 mentions that more than just one angel, a great company of the heavenly hosts come out and they praise God. And they praise him by saying what is recorded in verse 14, which we'll look at in just a minute. But first, we have to ask the question, why shepherds? Uh, Out of all the people the angels could have appeared to, why shepherds? And uh, as my youth always love when I say it, there are many different views on this. So the one view is that the angel appeared to the shepherds because the shepherds were available and they knew where the manger was, right? So that's pretty practical. There's shepherds outside. They know where the manger is, so they appeared to the shepherd and spoke to the shepherd, and they went. Um, another view is that in, uh, in the other Gospels, we have the Magi that come to see Jesus. And so the Magi are representative of the Gentiles that are now being included in God's plan. And we have the shepherds who are representative of Israel being a part of God's plan. So yes, Israel is a part of God's plan, but also the Gentiles, the rest of the world, are a part of it too. And then there's the, uh, the third view, and I think uh, you can take a little bit of each of these, but the third view is that there's a, a main shepherd theme going on in this whole passage. So we know that, first of all, David himself was a shepherd. David has talked a lot about the, this passage. We have the town of David, the line of David. And in Micah 5.4, which is just two verses after the passage that we mentioned earlier, it says this, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. So here's a prophecy just two verses later saying that this coming um, Savior will be a um, shepherd. He will shepherd his people. And then in John 10, 11, Jesus is recorded as saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So here in Luke 2, we've got uh, the shepherd of David. We have the shepherds that are appeared to them who go and see Jesus, who himself is the good shepherd. And so there's this strong shepherd theme going on in this whole passage. Now, with that, on to verse 14. And this verse is very confusing because it has been translated into major different ways. The traditional way is as it's in King James Version. It says, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's the more traditional way of translating it. In the NIV, however, it reads as this, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So these two are translated, as you can tell, very differently. So the first part is the same, and there's agreement on how this is to be translated. So it says, glory to God in the highest heaven. And it means that God, in his place in heaven, already possesses glory. 
Okay, so that's important. It's not as though God's sitting in heaven waiting to receive glory when we say it, but God is in heaven and he is already glorified completely. But in the revealing of his son, Jesus Christ, we glorify him through that. We see Jesus, we see the glory that's in that, and so we acknowledge the glory that God already has. The second part, however, is the one that there's a lot of debate about. Um, So the King James Version, uh, it used different versions of the New Testament that are not as reliable as the ones that we have today. Um, the, The Bible that we have today, the translations that we have today, have older and more reliable Greek texts that we translate from. Um, and so in this verse, the difference is actually the result of one Greek letter. That, that's what makes the difference, but it makes quite a big difference in how it's understood. So in the more traditional interpretation, it says, on earth, peace and good will towards men. And so when it's seen this way, it's seen in uh, three different lines. So we have one, Jesus' birth brings A, glory to God. It brings B, peace on earth. And it brings C, goodwill towards men. And so that could mean, you know, peace on earth, and then like sort of happiness for all humanity because of Jesus' birth. Um, And to be honest, this sounds like a really nice option, Um, but commentators and Bible translators have since said that this is not actually the correct way to translate it. Now, in light of the better manuscripts that we have, they interpret this verse not in three lines, but in two. Jesus' birth brings A, glory to God in the highest, and B, on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So ultimately, what this comes down to is how the word goodwill is to be understood. In the traditional sense, goodwill is attributed to humanity, wherein in the modern translation, goodwill is attributed to God, meaning that the people who receive peace is based on God's good will. So this means that Jesus' birth would not actually bring peace to all people, but only to those who trust in Jesus and follow after him. But this brings us back to verse 10. Whereas the angel tells the shepherd that the good news of Jesus' birth is for all the people. So why would his birth bring joy to all people, but only peace to some? Yet in addressing this question, right away we know that Jesus' birth did not actually bring joy to every single person in the world. And in fact, we actually see this in Herod's response to Jesus' birth when he goes out and murders the newborn babies. His birth certainly did not bring joy to Herod. And indeed, there are many people in the world today who do not receive joy from the birth of Jesus Christ. So... Who would have received joy at Jesus' birth? It makes sense that the joy is for all the people waiting for the son of David, the Messiah, the Lord, to be born, as it says in the very next verse. And so in the same way that God's peace is only for his people, the joy that comes with Jesus' birth is also only for his people as well. But who are God's people, right? On, on whom does God's favor rest? And quite simply, we can say that it rests on those who trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and who follow after him. And this brings me to Romans 5. This is one of my favorite uh, passages in Scripture. And in verse 1 it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the peace that we have with God? It continues in verse 9. It says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So you see, the peace that comes through Jesus' birth is not necessarily a peace that is seen immediately in the world around us. It's not a peace that means there is no more war or no more suffering. For even when Jesus was born, there was war going on. Indeed, there is not peace on earth currently, and nor do all people have happiness. However, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ have peace in their relationship with God. And what does that mean? It means that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he satisfied God's wrath in our place. By his death, the wrath that was rightfully meant for us, he took upon himself. And now, 
having put our trust in Jesus, we have peace and reconciliation in our relationship with God. His wrath towards us has been satisfied, and we have peace and a right relationship with him. And so in the first part, we see that we have peace knowing that Jesus has come and that he is the Messiah. And now we see that the peace we have in our relationship with God, and we will continue to have peace in our relationship with God when we stand before him at the end of time. We will not be punished, but we will have peace with God because of what Jesus has done for us. But for the time being, we are an excluded people. Followers of Christ are looked down upon, they're marginalized, they're considered to be out of touch with time. Maybe in your own personal faith, you may get made fun of by your coworkers, maybe you made fun of from your friends at school, you might even be isolated from your own family members. And as time goes on, this exclusion that we feel from society will probably only get worse. But yet we have a peace through it all. We have a peace that Jesus has come. And we have peace in our relationship with God, both now and for all eternity. And so although the exclusion we feel is temporary, we have peace that the hope and the peace we have is for all eternity. And this brings us to our third and final section, verses 15 through to 20. Let's read. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. The angels finish talking. The shepherds do what the angels told them to do. They go and find this baby. They go and they find Mary and Joseph, just as the angel had told them. In verses 17 through to 20, we see two very different responses to all that has happened. On the one hand, we have Mary, who treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then on the other hand, we have the shepherds who praise God and spread the word to others. Looking at Mary, we see her here as a virgin who just gave birth to the Savior, and she is contrasted with those in verse 18 who are amazed at the shepherds' comments. See, whereas the hearers only saw what happened on a surface level, Mary has been given an inside look into everything that's happened. She has been visited by an angel, she's been impregnated as a virgin through the Holy Spirit, and now she witnesses as these shepherds have been told by an angel to come and see her newborn baby. Yes, the onlookers are amazed at what happened, but Mary understands everything in a deeper sense, and she reflects on it. On the other hand, we have the shepherds who, rather than pondering the things deeply, go out glorifying God praising him and telling others about what they have seen and heard. They are excited and vocal about what they've been able to witness. And in many ways, I think that we need to be both like Mary and like the shepherds. With Mary, we too know about who Jesus is. And in fact, we even know more about Jesus than what Mary knew. Um, and we have a peace knowing that Jesus is the Messiah who was prophesied about, that by his life and death we have peace in our relationship with God, and we can reflect on these things and treasure them in our heart. But also with the shepherds, we should also be led to praise God for the sending of his son. And similarly, we should also be led to go out and tell others about this amazing story. So having looked at this story with what I hope is a fresh perspective, may we as followers of Jesus hold dear the peace that we have despite the exclusion we may feel. May we reflect on all that Jesus' birth means, the fulfillment of scripture, the offer of forgiveness through his life and death, the peace he gives us in our relationship with God, and the hope we have for the peace that we have with him in eternity. May we not be discouraged by our exclusion from society or our workplace or our schools or even our families, but instead may we hold these things in our heart, praising God for them and telling others about this good news.